Uh, my name is Jim Chung, and I'm the executive director of the GW Office of Entrepreneurship. Um, today, I'm just going to take a couple minutes of your time to tell you about two things. One is that entrepreneurship at GW is, has made impressive strides this year. So in the, just in the last year, we have made the top 25 list of best entrepreneurship programs in the country uh, for the first time. I'm very excited about that. The reason we've been able to make it to the top 25 this year, I think, is a recognition of all the wonderful things that have been going on at GW over the last few years, thanks to the efforts of John Rollins, the Office of Entrepreneurship, the Business School, the Engineering School, the Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence, all coming together, working as a group to, to create opportunities for our students through our workshops, through our Career Services Office, through this, this competition, and through our i program. So I want to thank everybody, um, including the volunteers here, who have been involved in our programs um, to um, bring GW up in the, the rankings to the top 25. Um, the second thing I will do today um, is to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, um, Duke Chung, who is no relation to me, but a very good friend. Um, Duke's actually the, one of the first three people I met when I first came down and moved down to DC from Boston. Uh, one, of my, one of our mutual friends, who is also a VC in Boston, actually moved down to um, D.C. one year before me. And I gave him a call and said, hey, who do I need to meet when I go down there? And he says, well, you've got to meet Duke. So I was like, okay, I'll, go, I'll meet Duke. Um, I met Duke over at the Ritz by the, by the Georgetown, and he was sitting there smoking his big cigar when I walked in and offered me a cigar, and we're hanging out, and we just really hit it off really well. Um, and ever since then, we've been, you know, best buds. So I'm very happy to uh, have Duke here to tell us about his really amazing story. Um, he just recently sold his company to Microsoft for $100 million. And get this, he started his, his company as a student in his dorm. Okay? He started in his dorm. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the story. Duke, please. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I, I forgot the cigar story. I, hopefully that was after we sold it to Microsoft, not in the early days. <laughs> but uh, it's really, really a pleasure. I guess it's funny how you know, circles kind of turn around, and 10 years later, I'm back at the university, which is actually pretty cool. Um, our story started uh, about uh, a little over 10 years ago. Uh, I started this company called Parature in Cornell, and it was a very interesting time, as some of you may remember. Um, the dot-com had just pretty much crashed. And, uh, but we didn't really know what that meant because uh, other than, I would say, about half of our school, maybe a third of our class had dropped out of uh, Cornell to start a business. So our entire college town was transformed into an incubator. Uh, all these old pizza stores that had been selling pizza for many years all became startup incubators, which was, I'd never seen that before, but I thought that was what the school was about. So a lot of people followed that path. Um, we started in 2001. Um, the product we created at the time was this live chat technology. And uh, we were very close to the Blackboard uh, co-founders uh, that had started over in Cornell. And they were building e-learning technologies for schools. And then one of the things we had seen in the university environment was that uh, we had access to high-speed internet. And we're in Ithaca, where I would say at the time, probably 90% of the world was still on dial-up. But the high-speed internet, the analogy I use is you know, we had access to real-time quotes that uh, pe other people didn't have at the time. So we could see a little bit further, maybe two, three years ahead of where the market was going. And if everybody was moving into a high-speed internet, we could deliver technologies that were built for that. And it would give us a couple years head start. So what we did, what we did was we teamed up with Blackboard. Uh, and the live chat product was a collaboration product designed for students originally. And we, had, we really had no idea, but we asked them. We said, hey, you have all these students using Blackboard. What else could we do to enrich that experience? And they said, you know, focus on collaboration. Bring all the students together through uh, a collaboration software like instant messaging. So we built that for the school, and it was great. You know, our whole school was on it. Uh, it, it actually was uh, very fast deployed. Uh, many students just signed up for it very quickly. Then sometime in summer of 2001, um, one of my co-founders, this is just a few months after we launched the product, we're going through the summer, and my co-founder said, hey, if we built this product, why don't we put it online and let people use it uh, and see if anybody else could use it for free? So we set up a website, and we put the live chat product there. 
And by the end of summer of 2001, we had about three to 400 uh, small businesses sign up to use our software. And we were fascinated. We had, what we had done to that point was we had scrapped together uh, some, uh, a little bit of funding, maybe uh, $15,000, $20,000, including <laughs> continuing to use the credit cards that we use for school that were linked to our parents' accounts. So we just tried to maximize all that. Um, we bought one server. Uh, we can only afford one database at the time, and we just pulled together all the computers. The computers back then were like today, where everyone has a laptop and flat screens. Back then, you know, everyone actually had desktops. So below your desk in your dorm, you actually had this huge tower, and everybody had one because all the parents would buy these, buy the kids one, right? And we didn't have any air conditioning in the dorms. I hear these days uh, there's air conditioning in the dorms. So summer Ithaca is actually quite hot. <laughs> um, we had all these servers. We basically used the free Ethernet in the school to power the high-speed Internet. And we lined up all of our servers. They all look different. Some were taller, some were shorter. And we used that to power the computing power behind the chat. And we delivered the service through the web. And the reason why I would say three to 400 companies actually signed up for this product was because um, it, was a, it was a time where there was a revolution, in, in our opinion, that was happening. Um, the Amazons and the Ebates had all gone public, and the small businesses were looking, away, looking to find their way online, and they would uh, need to find a way to engage with their customers. So they signed up for our chat, and they used it on their website. And we could tell there was a lot of usage because from time to time, our servers would actually shut down <laughs> because of uh, being uh, overutilized. We'd take the fans that we had from our parents and actually use it to try to cool the servers, but they were, we could tell there was a lot of usage on there. And uh, what we found out uh, on how they were using the software was we, we ended up calling all of them. And we said, we actually just cold called them and said, what are you using our software for? And they told us these remarkable stories. They would tell us things like, here, we're watching uh, all these big companies go online and reaching a larger audience. We're a small retail shop in our small town. We sell flowers where we sell clothes. But we want to reach a larger audience. We want to market to you know, the whole world. We don't want to just sell to our small community. And back then, people actually were, if some of you may remember, but were actually sort of scared to buy online because of issues like credit card fraud. People didn't know if they used your credit card online, if the website would be there the next day. And funny how that now, 10 years later, you know, everything's changed, right? Now, it used to be go to the store, uh, yeah, go online to do your research, then go to the store to buy it. And today, everything's the opposite. It's almost go to the store to look at what the camera looks like, then go back online to find the better price, right? So. Ten years later, everything's kind of turned around. And, but back then, the problems were different. And uh, the brands weren't well recognized. You were buying from a company that people didn't know. And this big problem around customer service uh, evolved, which was you've bought something, but you don't know how to re return it back to these online stores. It was not only a first-time experience for the consumer, but it was also a first-time experience for the retailers as well. And so our chat was very popular. They put it right dead center in the middle of their page. And they said, if you have any questions, Click here to chat with a live customer service agent, and somebody here will help you uh, with your returns. They would, you just chat with them, they would issue an RMA and say, send it to this address, and a few days later, they'd make sure that you get your credit for it. So it became very, very popular, and uh, we asked, the first question we asked these uh, companies was, which, is this something you would pay for? And they said, uh, they, they said yeah, they, they, well, it was a sort of an 80-20, I would say. 20-80% said, there's no way I'm paying for it. 20% said, yeah, there's real value here, we'll pay for it, uh, but depends how much you want to charge us. So we started very small. We started charging $5 a user per agent uh, that was providing answers. So the agent would be a customer service agent. And we figured it's some ratio relative to the amount of customers you had. So at some point, if you had a lot of customers, you would have to hire another agent. And it was just 5 bucks a user uh, per month when we started. And that's how the business started. Uh, it was just one agent at a time converting the free customers to paying customers. And every month, we would get more and more sign-ups, and what we would focus on is converting them over. And then we realized, wow, this is really amazing. We took a look at the customer service space. We had been in the student space. We looked at the customer service space was actually paying us money for it. And we said, you know, maybe we're onto something fascinating. And what we realized was in the customer service industry at the time, uh, predominant channels for customer service were phone and, uh, and email. Phone was the most popular. So if you remember, if you have any questions, you just pick up a 1-800 number and you call them for help. And then email was getting more popular, but no one had done anything online. And we thought, wow, this is a really unique opportunity to transform this industry. Customer service had been a sort of a sleepy industry, and we thought we could really bring a lot of innovation to this space, especially with the uh, internet technologies taking off. So we continued to press the gas pedal on the live chat, and what we ended up building was this complete suite of applications. And we, what we believed was that companies didn't want to build these technologies, but instead 
they'd rather license it if somebody had it in place. So what we created was a live chat technology, then we created self-service, which lets customers go online and find their own answers. And then we said, you know, with emails, what we found out was that 30% of customer service questions were actually follow-up questions to uh, not hearing back from the retailer before. And so when you look at those stats, you say, wow, why would you spend all this time calling the company again or sending another email to find out where your previous issue was? So we created an online case management system where you could submit your question online. And then what we did was we innovated. We saw what that FedEx, FedEx was doing, and we, we issued a tracking number for every single customer service issue. So you could see where your issue was at any given time. And it, it's, it, for those of you who've been to Pop Belly at lunch, you'll see if you stand at the door, it'll say, there's, a, there's just a sign there that says, you know, you'll get your sandwich in seven minutes if you stand here. It's basically the same expectation setting that we created for these companies, which was your issue is here, it's been escalated to this group, and it would take a, you'll get an answer back within eight hours. So n people never followed up with more questions saying, you know, where's my issue? Because they always knew at any time where their issue was along the way. And so we created that online. You could track that, your issue, just like you track your package. And that was a huge hit in 2005. So by 2006, uh, we had grown to about a three to $4 million revenue company on very little capital. Um, we were 100% built in the cloud. Uh, it was one of the things that we had learned early on was, let's just do one thing really well. And, do, and instead of selling the software to be installed and hosted, we picked one path, and we knew how to sell the software through the web, so we focused on that path. And by 2006, we had a competitor um, called uh, Right Now Technologies that uh, was about 10 times our size uh, in revenue and in distribution sales teams. And we, when we competed, we got to the level where we, we wanted to target specific accounts. So we wanted to call into the Macy's, we wanted to call into the Best Buys, and we called these customer service contact center managers. They all said, you know, we've uh, already selected this product called Right Now last week or a couple weeks ago, and uh, but your product looks great. We just we just you know wish that you were at the table at the time when we did the eva evaluation. And by the way, who's Paratur and are you guys going to be around for a year? So we had all these questions, right? These unknowns because we're still a small startup. And what we heard from their sales team was uh, their head of sales was that we could probably win about 50% of the time when we competed with them, but every time we won one deal, they would win nine. And the reason for that was because we only had four sales reps at the time, and we could only get to so many deals. But every time we won one deal, they would win another nine. Their sales team was just a lot larger, and we couldn't get to those deals fast enough. So it was a simple math equation. We just said, maybe this is the right time for us to really expand our sales team and to, to get to every single deal. Because if we can win at least half the time, out of the 10 deals, we could win four more. And so that would you know, increase our market share in the space. So the the, the hypothesis of the time was, let's go raise money and do this. And in 2006, uh, we raised our Series A financing. Uh, it was $13.5 million. And from 2001 to 2006, it took five years to get to 300 customers, paying about 1000 bucks a month um, each. Uh, and then from 2006, when the funding came in, to 2008, after hiring a professional VP of sales, doubling our sales team, we doubled our install base from 300 to uh, 600 in those two years and also doubled our price. So we went from $1,000 a month to $2,000 a month. And so by the end of 2008, uh, we're growing to about a $10 million business uh, just because of the financing and the investments we put in there. And so by 2008, um, something really interesting happened. Uh, one of uh, a, a very famous West Coast uh, venture capital firm, uh, Excel Partners, called us and said, hey, you know, we've been hearing a lot about Paratur, mainly through our own portfolio companies. And they had about 60 active portfolio companies Excel, for those of you who don't know, uh, has been really famous in the last few years. They backed Facebook. They backed uh, Kayak. Um, so they're very reputable in the Bay Area. And to have powered uh, you know, more than a third of their portfolio companies with Paratur was really a privilege. Nothing that had planned just happened coincidentally. And they called us and said, hey, all the founders and CEOs of our companies are using Paratur. And we've been hearing a lot about your products. Uh, are, do you need any money? <laughs> Basically was the ask. So we said, why don't we talk and see if this makes sense? Five weeks later, uh, they let our Series B financing for $16 million and um, was almost the perfect timing because, for those who remember, 2008, uh, the roof essentially collapsed, and, uh, and we were the last investment Excel made for 12 months uh, just because the markets had really turned uh, the other way. But we had a lot of cash, so all of a sudden we had $16 million plus cash in our bank account. There was no giving the cash back because the money's already in our bank account. <laughs> 
And uh, what we experienced in the next couple of years was really remarkable. All, a lot of the early stage companies that we started with, many of them actually didn't make it through the in the next two years. Uh, and remember, our business is on a subscription model. So the very early stage companies, uh, many of them were either acquired, many of them couldn't make it through uh, that difficult time period. And we essentially were affected as well because our lower end customers uh, churned quite a bit. And uh, without having that capital in place, uh, we may not have also made it through that period of time. And it all happened so quickly. I would say within three to six months, the markets had really turned. And part of it was, I would say, a lot of the lack of experience on our side building companies for the first time. A lot of these things you just couldn't predict. We didn't realize that would be effect. We had, for example, Paratrue had five to six companies in the history that had been acquired by Google, our customers. And at some point when they're acquired, like a YouTube, um, you know, gets rolled up into the uh, Google infrastructure and they won't no longer be a client. The other customers actually just go out of business, right? So they try to make it through, but we can only do so much to help them, right? And, and they didn't make it through that period. But fortunately, we had a lot of cash on us. So uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010 were actually fairly difficult years for us, and I would say for the industry. And then coming out of 2010, um, you started to see the market sort of pick up again. And one thing we learned through that process was instead of focusing on a lot of the smaller customers, let's move upstream and focus more on the mid-market and larger customers that were more stable. And it, we couldn't have done that in the beginning because in the early stage of Paratrue, you don't have the credibility to serve these larger customers. You almost have to start with the smaller businesses to build your traction, to build the credibility. And if you choose to move upstream, you have that uh, ability to do so several years down the road. So we view the small businesses as a really a, a necessary evil for us to start the business. But where we ended up serving in the last two, three years were really around the larger companies. And, and that's where, you know, sometime around two years ago, Microsoft came to us and said, you know, you're, we're, we're really interested in the customer service space. Uh, it's really changed so much uh, in the landscape. And it, bringing back to the beginning of the story, when we started as just providing online support, in the last two or three years, the technology evolved so quickly that we started to develop technologies for social. We introduced social customer service, which is what we believe the next generation of where customer service is heading towards for a lot of millennials that are coming out, you know, today with the intersection of social and mobile, by the time you have a bad interaction at a retail store or another experience, you might have forgotten about it when, by the time you go home to actually say something about it. Today when you go to the store and you have a bad experience, you'll probably take out your phone and you might actually say something right there on the social channel and you might say it publicly, right? So that's, that's where this has completely transformed the service space again. So from the old school, we call it old school, phone, email, to online support, now social, uh, what we're seeing is that more and more customer service questions are happening in social channels. Companies are seeing them being posted on Twitter and Facebook, in Yelp, uh, in LinkedIn, and it's all public. And that's why, as, if you don't remember anything that I'm talking about today, if you ever complain, if you want to get your answer faster, go to a social channel. And we're battling that, we're seeing that being battled internally right now. They're willing to actually wait to respond to your email and to your phone call. They don't mind putting you on, call, on hold for another 10 minutes while they're answering the, your questions on social because social is 100% public. And so if they don't respond, it doesn't look good. If they respond poorly, it looks bad. So they're focusing a lot of their efforts on making sure they respond professionally to you and publicly. And by the way, you know, the way they respond is a representation of the culture of their customer service teams. And so before doing business with a company, you may want to go take a look at how they're responding to other customers in social channels. And that's where social has really transformed customer service, and we think that's the next five to ten years. So we built all these technologies in the last three years, and Microsoft saw that as well and said, we need to get in here. But for us to get in here, it would take us several years to build these technologies and to catch up in the space. Uh, so that relationship happened a couple years ago, but it really was last year when they came in uh, and they called us, they really just called us out of blue and said, you know, we're really, really, really serious now about the space. Uh, we'd love to touch base with you. So they actually flew into town. Uh, it was sort of a cryptic email that they called me and they said, hey, let's get together for drinks. So we said, sure, we'll talk to you. We had dinner with them that night. And basically the message was, look, we're going to get into the space. We're going to either build it or we're going to buy something in the space. And we have five competitors in the space as well. But Paratrue was really their top choice. And they said, if you guys say no, We'll go to the second guy. If they say no, we'll go to the third guy, fourth guy, et cetera. And if everybody says no, then we'll have to build this. We'll have to build it ourselves, uh, which is, I think, not their preference because, you know, when you think about not having the technology and you're Microsoft and you're competing against Oracle and SAP and these big guys that ha that have the technology, they're losing 
a lot of money every year by not having the products in the market. We estimated at least $100 million a year uh, by not having the products out there and losing that market share to the competitor. So having the product today was really important for them. And uh, what started in February last year and ended up sometime around the December time frame was uh, the negotiations of Microsoft acquiring Periture and really bringing us to market. Um, they had 40, 50,000 customers. Um, we had uh, reached about close to 1,000 ourselves. But the opportunity to work with somebody like Microsoft to get Periture's products to their 40 to 50,000 customers, not only uh, in the United States or on a domestic basis, but more so on an international basis, on a global scale, was really exciting for us uh, as, as a company. And the other thing that was really important for us was uh, I think the culture was really important at the end, and making sure that you know, the culture we had built uh, as an early stage company really matched the culture of Microsoft's company as well. Um, you know, IBM was our largest customer, and so as you can imagine, you know, IBM was naturally at the end of the table as well. And we, and we actually went to all the conferences, we looked at IBM, and a couple of my co-founders, I actually left in the middle of the conference because we were like, wow, this is really old school, <laughs> the way they think about things, right? I think, I'm not sure if we'd actually survive in IBM long-term wise, just because of the way they think about technology today. And they're a truly successful company, and I don't want to say anything bad about them. They're, they've gone to where they are today, because of all the great things they've done, but just specifically around how they look at the next five years, we didn't think it was as progressive as where Microsoft was. And so a lot of that helped us kind of narrow down our decision toward the end. And I think we made a great decision. Uh, Microsoft at the end acquired our business. As Jim said, uh, I guess technically I'm not supposed to say, but the press uh, says $100 million, and uh, they're keeping everybody in the company. Uh, they're keeping everybody here in this area. We've become uh, Microsoft's fourth office. Uh, they have three offices uh, already, one in Maryland, one in DC and one in Virginia and Reston. And we're very close to the Reston office. Uh, and they're sending their people here to run the business. So we thought it was awesome. You know, there were actually people moving from Seattle area, buying homes here, investing into this area, and really focusing on building Paratur up to be a successful business here. And uh, one of our big verticals was, was federal. So we have a lot of federal agencies that are using Paratur. And they view that as a really strategic vertical for them as well. So focusing on that. But this had been a, a tremendous uh, and really, really exciting uh, story for us from what really started as you know, working in the dorm rooms in the early days, figuring out how to really leverage our technology to, do, to transform customer service through over the next few years of growing the business, getting the capital required to build it, and then ultimately ending up with uh, Microsoft and being a part of the Microsoft family. Uh, in just over 10 years, uh, not only was it you know, just a really fun and exciting story for us, but I would say an incredible outcome as well for everybody who started with us in the early days uh, to have be part of Microsoft and to have made, uh, in many cases, quite a bit of money as well. When I calculated our, our employees, uh, close to 10 employees became millionaires through this transaction. And so we couldn't be more proud about that uh, just here locally, you know, in the DC area, uh, that, that journey to end up uh, where everybody did, so. Uh, we're really, really excited, and uh, I know Jim had asked me to make sure I leave a little room for questions, so I wanted to make sure I do that, but I thought I'd share that high-level story. And maybe before I close, sort of summarize three things that are really important lessons that I learned through the way. Um, one is, I think when you build your company, the culture is really, really important. Um, and as you can tell, as we ended up uh, uh, deciding who we wanted to sell to, it was, it was a really important factor for us as well. So focusing on the culture from day one, I think a lot of people underestimate how effective building a good culture is for an early stage company. Um, and it all starts really at the top. So the founders and the CEO will lead the culture, but mainly the founder will, uh, as, as they stay in the company and build that culture. In our case, you know, we're very customer-centric culture, so it was a huge advantage for us throughout the years. Customers didn't want to leave. And even when we were acquired by Microsoft, our customers told Microsoft that you know, if you change the people, then we quit. And it was the message that they told Microsoft. So it could tell you how much, how passionate we were around making sure our customers were successful. And that was the attitude we had from day one. And it was really important. I think that that culture, whatever culture the company is, that drives ultimately a lot of the success. Second, I think one of the things that we learned in the early days, we didn't, remember, we didn't raise a lot of capital from day one. We had to bootstrap this business. And the lessons we learned from that is uh, really, there's a lot of advantages for not raising capital too early. Um, you know, we had built, we scrapped together twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars to buy one database to power all of our customers. So we found out a way to modify the software so that we could be more effective. We didn't realize, you know, ten years later, that actually was our one of our biggest competitive advantages was we were able to scale 
and maintain our margins in this business at a lower price to go to the market to compete, where our, whereas our competitors had to set up one database for every single license they set up. So that cost structure of $20,000, $25,000 was built into every single one of their licenses. Whereas in our case, we had one database. We could support hundreds of customers on there. So we could actually compete at a lower price, but still maintain a good margin in this business. Had we had raised capital from day one, say we raised a million dollars too early, honestly, I don't think we would have tackled that problem. We would have gone the same path that everyone else gone to, which is just deploy one database per license, and we would have lost that competitive advantage. The fact we didn't have access to that capital really forced us to really rethink about how we could do this more effectively. And I think that, it, that discipline is actually very helpful if thought of the right way when you're starting your business. It could later on be a really good competitive advantage for you over time. And then I would say, lastly, if you don't remember anything I say in this uh, keynote presentation, uh, the one thing at the end of the day I think is most important is, and I actually, you know, this was reiterated when Microsoft uh, bought our business was, uh, revenue, at the end of the day, cures all illnesses. <laughs> uh, if you don't remember anything I say today, just remember that. Revenue cures all illnesses. Revenue for early stage tech company may not happen that early because they're building users or building momentum, as you can see with you know, technologies like WhatsApp that might not have a lot of revenue. But ultimately, to, to live and survive, and we learned that the hard way with a lot of our early customers that didn't make it through, and we learned it through our own path, that ultimately revenue will be the most important thing uh, for your business. So putting your eye and focusing on revenue, making sure that's ultimately your end goal of where you need to go to is, is really, really important. And I think in the early stage, it, 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 may not, it may be a plan to get to that revenue. So you don't necessarily in a tech company have to have a lot of revenue from day one, but you need to have a path to get to revenue at some point. So, so if you don't remember anything, remember revenue uh, at the end of the day cures, cures all illness. So let me uh, open up and see if you've got any questions. Yes. So it sounded like there was something special about the environment at Cornell when you were an undergraduate. You talked about bandwidth. What I was wondering is, was there something there that, that you could put your finger on that made Cornell an entrepreneurial place versus other schools? Yeah. I, um, you know, I attribute a lot to, you know, part of the other things that we've learned is really the ecosystem that you're in. And fortunately for us, Cornell was a very strong entrepreneurial community. Well, I mean, we happen to be in the engineering group, right? So probably more nerds, I would say, than entrepreneurs, but you know, you're in that group every day. And I think what I hear and what I've learned through Jim and, and, and John Rollins is that you know, building the ecosystem is really important. It's, it's a, it ends up being who you associate with um, you know, in your lives, right? So you spend two, three years in business school, or in under, four years in undergrad, and you're, you're with people of like mind. I think that really changed my life. Uh, had I not gone there into a different school, I may have been in a different path. But the fact that we were always there, Everybody was really interested in what was happening in the industry at the time, and all the internet companies are going public. That was all the discussions we talked about. And you know, when your discussions over beers are about that, uh, over coffee or about that, you start to really immerse yourselves in that type of thinking. And those four years at Cornell when we were there really transformed uh, our lives. Uh, our friends were all thinking the same way, starting companies. So you're in that type of group, uh, ultimately, you end up doing the same thing, right? So I think you know, associating yourselves with the right type of group uh, early on is really, really important. So you know, for the reasons why you go to a really good school, you go to GW, you go to Cornell, you, know, you want to group yourselves with people that think the same way you do. And that really transforms your lives for years to come. I mean, not only be those are your friends for many years, right? But you may end up starting business like we did. And starting it early certainly has that advantage, right? And meeting the right people. Any other questions? Jim? So the, the story, the way that you, um, you told it, sounds very almost linear. It was a success. We did this. Were there any moments along the way that were kind of dark moments or were kind of like, oh, my God, what are we going to do next? Or was it smooth sailing? Yeah, well, it's never, it's never smooth sailing. Uh, <laughs> the dark moments I could probably talk for an hour uh, about. <laughs> um, we'll need a longer keynote for that. Um, but you know, it's, it, every company will have uh, issues. Even companies that are public today that are doing very well from the outside, every company has issues. You just don't know what they are. We had our fair share of issues. And there's many issues along the way. I think the biggest challenge for early stage company is running out of cash. 
And so you're always watching that, right? So if you don't focus on revenue, which is your source of income, your primary source of income, you'll you risk running out of cash. And that's why most companies fail. I think the number one reason why companies fail is they run out of cash, you know, too early, or it's it's misused. There are other issues along the way. You know, I had three or four co-founders, um, and the personality changes over time. You know, with success creates actually a lot of options, and therefore, you know, people may end up in different paths. So I, you know, when you pick your co-founders. You know, I would say you might not be able to anticipate everything um, in five years or ten years where everybody ends up. You may be able to see two to three years out. But it is a necessary evil. I think if you have to start with a co-founder, you have to start. You just have to figure out how to make that work. But there's a set of issues related to that. Um, and many, many more, right, along the way. And I mentioned in 2008, we hadn't seen the bottom of our customer base kind of fall out. And that ultimately affected our business as well. So we had to modify our business to make us survive through that period of time as well. So every company has issues. A lot of those issues are sleepless nights. So you know, you, it all looks good at the end when Microsoft buys a company. But the journey to get to where we are, there were a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of ulcers along the way. <laughs> and ultimately, we ended up in a great place. But I, when you look back, despite all that, I think that's all part of the journey. You know, there's no company that will just be 100% positive all the way to the end and continue to grow. I think those issues that come up, those problems that you see, even with companies, for example, like Tesla today, right? They have issues along the way. Those actually are all really great opportunities for the entrepreneur as problems to solve to help build a business. So we never viewed any of these issues as really concerns, but we just viewed them as obstacles for us to try to solve. Uh, some are short-term problems, some are long-term problems. But as long as you're continuing to solve them, the entrepreneurial journey is about solving problems. And the problems you see five to 10 years from now in your journey are different than what you see today. But if that's your mindset, um, you're, you're well prepared to be an entrepreneur, and um, you know as, as the challenges come up, just tackle them as they go. So, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations thank you so on your success. Good to have you. Thank you for being here.